Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the St. Pete Science Festival. My name is Amanda, and I'm going to be your MC for this exciting presentation. Today, we are going to meet a mad scientist and have some fun with some live science experiments. So I am pleased to introduce to you Jeff from Mad Science. Jeff, go ahead and take it away. Hi there, I'm Jurassic Jeff from Mad Science, and we're going to have some fun with science today. I miss being at the St. Pete Science Festival two years now. So hopefully next year we're going to all be there and it's going to be a whopping festival. So it's going to be a great time. All right. So today, you know, it's fun. It's funny that I follow Nick, Mr. Nick, the weatherman, because that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. We're going to talk about air pressure today and how air pressure can help kind of make the weather that he was talking about at his presentation. So air pressure is something that's around us all the time. It's something we pay very little attention to because we, we're so used to it. We're so used to it on us all the time, but it's around us. It's pressing down on us all the time and it weighs a lot. It's always exerting a lot of pressure, okay? As much as an elephant sitting on top of us. If you think about an elephant, an elephant weighs six to 7,000 pounds. That's how much air is sitting on top of us all the time. You're probably thinking, how can we deal with six to 7,000 pounds of something sitting on top of us? It's because we're used to it. Everyone out there, take a big breath in. And hold it, blow it out. Did you feel all that air inside your bodies? Our bodies are awesome. Our bodies are equalized with air. And that means there's as much air pushing out from the inside of our bodies as there is pushing down on our bodies all the time. So we don't feel that enormous weight of air. We don't feel that elephant, but air pressure is always on us and it's powerful. I'm gonna show you how powerful there's air inside this bottle right here, okay? It's just an empty two liter bottle, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what happens if I just take the air out from the inside. Now, knowing that there's six to 7,000 pounds of air on us, but how do we get to six to 7,000 pounds? is let's take just one square inch, an inch about with, a, with a, a square with an inch on one side. And every square inch, there's 15 pounds of pressure here at sea level. That pressure is the amount of air from straight up to the top of our atmosphere, about 55 miles up there, pressing down right here at sea level on just one square inch, the amount of air, okay? That is equal to 14.7 pounds, but we're just gonna round up and say 15 pounds. So if you start adding up 15 pounds on this bottle for every square inch, 15 pounds there and 15 here and 15 there and 15 there, you get a lot of air pressure, probably a couple hundred pounds. Now what I'm gonna do is use something called a vacuum pump here. And this is kind of like what you use to suck air out and blow air out of your air mattresses and rafts at home and stuff. So something you can try at home if you want, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a vacuum in this space here. And that a vacuum is just a space with no air. So if I take the air out from the bottle that's pressing up on the bottle, what do you think is gonna happen to the bottle? Well, we're gonna feel that 15 pounds and 15 pounds and 15 pounds, that few hundred pounds of air pressure. I think the bottle is gonna get squashed, okay? We're gonna see that power of air pressure. So let's give it a try, okay? I'm just gonna hold the bottle here. In fact, I'll hold it up in the air here, okay? Really close to you guys. And then I'm gonna turn it on. This is what air pressure did to my bottle. Okay, now notice I took it out and I'm trying to get air back in there, but my bottle doesn't want to go back in shape. And that's because this bottle is made of a polymer and it's kind of a, a rigid plastic. But if I increase the air pressure again by blowing it up in there, I can probably refit my bottle. There it goes. Okay. So air pressing out from the inside, pressing down on the outside, shows you that power of air pressure. We use air pressure all the time or the power of it. We use these all the time, don't we? That works on air pressure. We use it to reduce pressure in our toilets in the water that creates an area of low pressure. We'll get back to these in a minute. But what I love doing with these is showing you again that power of air pressure by just taking two of them, pushing them together. And when I push them together, I'm gonna remove the air from the inside. Not all the air, but just some of it, okay? So I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but I heard a little air being pushed out. So now we have air pressing down on the outside, but not as much air on the inside. So what happens is they stick together. 
Okay, you've seen, heard of suction cups and sticky cups. They all work on air pressure, okay? In fact, there is, remember, about 15 pounds on every square inch. Now, I didn't get all the air out of here, but let me see if I can... Whoa, that's a lot of air pressure, okay? So, yes, so air pressure was just holding those two things together. All right. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about air pressure as well is because my friend, Mr. Egbert, is here with me today. And as you can see, he's not a happy egg. OK, he's not very excited today. OK. And the reason is this whole pandemic thing, it's 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 been terrible for us. We haven't been getting out. We haven't been doing live shows and he's gotten way too fat. OK, he's been eating too much. He's depressed. So no matter how I try to get him down in here, I can't force him in here. I can't get him back down to his home again. So he's he's pretty angry, okay? So I try to get him in here and I try to coax him. So I, I thought that air pressure might be the trick. If we could find air pressure on top of him, it just might be powerful enough to suck him down in there, okay? Suction, okay? And that's the difference in air pressure. So we need to figure out a way to get rid of the air underneath Egbert. If we can do that, that's going to increase that relative air, the amount of air, which is constant on top of him. But all of a sudden, he's going to feel that weight of air, kind of like we did to our bottle, except inside, it's going to be underneath. So we need to find a way to get rid of the air in that bottle. And my thought is we use fire, OK? Not because fire is fun, but because fire needs air, it needs oxygen, which is a big part of air. So if we build a fire in there, it's going to use up the air and reduce the pressure underneath Egbert. He's going to feel that increase in pressure on top of him, and it's just idea not to push him down in there. So let me, I'm going to do is I'm going to take Egbert real quick, and I'm going to take his clothes off real quick. And here he is again. He's just kind of a naked Egbert. Okay, you see him? Okay, still can't get in there, still too fat. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little piece of paper now, and I'm just gonna rip it, I'm gonna light it on fire. I'm gonna put a little drop of alcohol on it just so I can burn it faster, okay? Because alcohol burns. This is like the alcohol, like rubbing alcohol. All right, so I'm gonna take Egbert. I only got two hands here. I'll hold over here. He's a little bike. Really, really? What? I'll fill my fire. I'll fill my fire. I'm going to put Egbert on here. And there he goes. I got him in there. You see that air pressure work? That was just the difference in air pressure between in there, which was a lot less, and on top of him, which was a lot more. Wasn't that egg sighting? A great example of air pressure, the power of air pressure. I'm exasperated. Wait a minute. Egbert's trying to talk to me. Hmm? Yeah. Um, I didn't think of that. He's asking how he gets out of here. How is he going to get out of here? Wait a minute. If I used air pressure to get, I didn't think of that. Wait a minute. If I used air pressure to get him in, can I use air pressure to get him back out again? Man, I'm glad I'm a mad scientist here. I think that if I blow enough air up in there, it might build the air pressure in there, make it more in there than what's out here. And if I can do that, it just might be enough to get them back out here again. Shall I give it a try? I'll get down here where you guys can see me. Okay. Come on, Mr. Eggbird. And whoa, there he comes. Did you guys see that? That was air pressure again. Too fat to get in, but air pressure got him in. Too fat to get out, but air pressure got him out. So the power of air pressure, it's around us all the time. Okay. Let me show you in another example of air pressure. See this balloon right here? I blew air into it. Air's always trying to get out of balloons, isn't it? Okay, that's how balloons pop. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this stick. And I'm, this is something you guys can do at home. I'm gonna show you the secret to it. I'm gonna take the stick. What's gonna happen if I take the stick and I stick it in the balloon? You think it's gonna pop? Well, let's see if you guys are right. Take it. Whoops, I got it in there and it didn't pop. Not only that, I'm gonna stick it all the way through, you guys. Okay, watch this. Whoa, look at that. You guys see that? Did my balloon pop? No, how does he do that? Is this, a is this a magic show? No, it's not. It has to do with air pressure again, okay? 
and I put something on the edge of the stick. Now you're probably thinking that the stick is blocking the hole and that's why the balloon is not popping. So what would happen if I take the stick out? Is it gonna pop then? How can that be? There's holes in the balloon. Well, let me show you the secret here. What I did is I stuck the stick. This is just an ordinary barbecue stick. You guys have these at home probably. I stuck it in a little bit of Vaseline, okay? And that's a jelly, okay? And air pressure. You can see that air is slowly getting out of that balloon. So when I took the needle and I stuck it in the balloon, the air pressure took the Vaseline on the end of the stick and it spread it over the hole. And when I stuck it through the other end, it did the same thing. When I took the stick out, that air pressure kind of put pressure against the Vaseline and it spread it against the hole. Also, I stuck the uh, needle in the end of the balloon where the ends were, okay? Where there's a lot more rubber. Did you notice I didn't blow the balloon all the way up? If I took the balloon and I stuck it through the fat part, what do you think would happen? It's gonna pop, always, okay? So air pressure, a nice trick with air pressure you can use with Vaseline and a little stick, okay? All right, let me talk really quickly um, about an effect, some effects that air pressure has on us, okay? Mr. Nick was talking about storms, hurricanes, tornadoes. In science, I don't know if he used the term, I don't know if I saw him in time. In science, we use a generic term for all those types of weather in, wa in water and in air, okay? So he talked about tornadoes, okay? Uh, large amounts of air moving around in a circle, okay? We talked about hurricanes. Again, large amounts of air moving around in a circle, okay? In science, we call them vortexes, okay? That's a generic term for tornadoes, hurricanes, and in water, okay? Uh, and what we're gonna do, let's go back to these for a second. When we get finished, when we use these and we unclog our toilets, what we do is we flush the toilets. And does that water wanna go straight down that hole? No, it wants to go around and around and around and around a vortex. Water and air behave a lot alike. I'm gonna show you an example of that, okay? We have water here and we have air here, a bottle full of water, a bottle full of air. I'm gonna connect them uh, with, this, uh, with this little connector here. It has a hole in it. So I'm gonna take the connector. I'm gonna put it on here. This is called a tornado tube. You can buy these real cheap okay, and I'm gonna connect it. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this upside down now. So if I turn this upside down, is the air water gonna go from here to there? Well, that's what I think. I mean, water's heavier, right? And we just have air in there. I mean, air's not very powerful, right? So let's turn it upside down. And the water's not going down. It's air, they, why? Because there's air pressing up on the water. That pressure is enough to keep the water from going down. But you can see water slowly leaking down there and air slowly bubbling up. But if I can create a vortex, okay, I'm gonna create an area of lower air pressure, less air in the middle, higher pressure on the outside, the water's gonna wanna move much faster, okay? And do you guys see my tornado there? Okay, or whirlpool in water, okay, or a vortex in science, okay? Again, vortexes can be very powerful and we see them a lot. We see them in all the different storms that we see. They're called vortexes. So Mr. Nick was right, and it's all about air pressure. If we can concentrate low air pressure in the middle of a hurricane, okay, that is the area of lowest pressure. Higher pressure on the outside, more air, trying to get to the area of lowest pressure. The, fast, the lower the pressure in the middle, the faster the air wants to get there. So it's all about air pressure. Let me show you one more effect. I think I got a minute or two here of air. So, uh, so air exerts a lot of pressure on us all the time. When it wants to move, it moves in vortexes, okay? High pressure, lots of air to low pressure, less air. But there's also an effect that air pressure has on any surface as it moves along that surface. And it's called the Bernoulli effect. And it was named after the scientist that discovered it. Bernoulli was an Italian mathematician. He actually wasn't a scientist. He actually knew math really well. But he discovered that air, when it moves along a surface, it creates, it relieves pressure along that surface, okay? It creates what's called negative pressure. 
So let's talk about airplanes. How can they fly up in the air if we have all that pressure, that air pressure on them all the time? Because they're moving, okay? And wings are designed so air has to travel faster underneath the wing, or on I'm sorry, on top of the wing than it does underneath the wing because of the surface of the wing. The difference in speed creates a negative pressure. And that means the wing wants to go up and create a force called lift. We can see that by moving some air along a surface with a simple blow dryer. Something else you can do at home. I turn it on and I'm gonna create that Bernoulli effect with a ping pong ball. That's the Bernoulli effect right there, okay? Air running along the surface, creating negative pressure on that ball, okay? So it reduces the air pressure on that ball. And I can move it around and I can tilt it and it's gonna to wanna to stay in that area of lower pressure because higher pressure on the outside, okay? Let's see if I can be true to that. Yeah, that's the Bernoulli effect right there, how airplanes fly. Whoa, that's a good one. All right, so I just wanted to introduce air pressure to you, okay? And it kind of goes along with what Nick was talking about before, but I hope you guys had fun. I am ready to answer any questions about science, about air pressure, about anything today. Awesome. That was hilarious and exciting. I know I had a fantastic time watching this. Um, so we do have a few questions. How does air change, air pressure change when we're underwater? Oh, good question. Because when we're underwater, there's no air, there's water, right? But water exerts a lot more pressure on us than air because water is a lot more dense than air and heavier than air. Now it's really cool because I'm a big scuba diver. So I like to go underwater. And what happens to our bodies when we get underwater is just like our bodies in air, they equalize, they also equalize underwater. So the deeper we get underwater, the more that pressure of water forces on us, the more of the air in our body presses out to equalize that pressure. But we can't get too deep and we can't stay for too long because what starts to happen when a lot of pressure's on it is our blood, or is our, uh, the, uh, the, the air in our blood starts to change a little bit and nitrogen starts to come out and, uh, and that can create problems. So we always have to be very safe when we're diving, but water exerts a lot more pressure on us than air, but there's really no air down there in the water. It's all water. Awesome, great. Um, a similar question, what happens to air pressure if we're in a submarine? Ooh, very good question. Well, air, submarines create their own air. What they have, if you think about a sub, it can stay underwater for six months. So they have to constantly recycle their air. So remember that we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, all part of air. So in the submarine, they have to recycle that air, take out the carbon dioxide and put back in oxygen. So if they have oxygen tanks down there that they mix with that air as they cycle it through. So there's a constant amount of air pressure, just like it here, is here on the surface in the sub, that the air pressure that we're used to all the time, it's about 15 pounds per square inch, okay? And they're constantly recycling that air to put more oxygen in it and take out the carbon dioxide. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question, how do I become a mad scientist? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, the first thing, now before I became a mad scientist, I actually was a geologist, okay? And a geologist, geology, geo means the earth, ology means the history of, is a type of scientist that studies the earth. But that's how I got into mad science was I stopped being a geologist and said, I wanted to teach kids more and show kids how much fun science was. So I decided to become a professional mad scientist. But it would start with you becoming a scientist of your own, any field that you're interested in. Uh, and then maybe you could start teaching science and do all kinds of fun science for kids. So it's easy to become a mad scientist. So wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, why didn't the eggshell break? Did it have a shell? Well, remember I had a shell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little secret today, okay? I have my, uh, my Egbert egg and I have his identical twin brother here. When I say I, well, look at that, there's pressure on there. Oh, got it, okay. 
So, and I have his identical twin brother here, but just with no shell. So with the shell, the egg is hard, okay? And without the shell, this uh, is a hard boiled egg, the egg is soft, okay? So the egg, even though I can't push it down in there, there's no way I can get it in there. The air pressure takes it down, but without this, but with the shell, there's no give in it at all. And it might, uh, I've never actually tried it with an egg shell on, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't work because the egg shell is hard. So I need a little bit of give. So that's why I take the egg shell off, make a naked, naked egg bird. Awesome. Um, why does air pressure exist? What is its purpose? Well, air pressure exists because everything has mass, right? And what is mass? Anything that takes up space, okay, and has weighs something, okay? And air is just like everything else. This ping pong ball has mass. This lighter has mass. This piece of paper has mass. Air is a state of matter that's a gas but it does have mass, even though it doesn't feel like it weighs anything, it does weigh and it weighs a lot, okay? Remember, there's 55 miles of air from the top of our atmosphere to where I'm sitting here today, pressing down on me. And that's 15 pounds for every square inch, okay? So air is around us all the time. It does have mass and that's why it exists because it has weight and anything that has weight is, produces pressure. Thank you. How did you learn to manipulate the air to do these anomalies? Manipulate the air? Um, all I did was try to create lower air pressure. And I did that with my machine here, a vacuum pump, okay? That creates an area of lower pressure. Okay? And then with here, I read, so I'm just trying to get the air out of things. If I can get the air out of something, I can show you how much air pressure uh, exists. Okay. Like if I were to suck all the air out of my body, I would feel an elephant sitting on top of it. You'd see me squashed just like that. Okay. With the egg bird experiment, what I did was I just took the air out from the inside by making a fire. Fire needs oxygen, which is a big part of air. I quickly stuck egg bird on top. Once the fire used up all the air in there, the oxygen, the fire went out, egg bird felt that decrease in air pressure and it sucked it down. So, and then with this one right here, by just spinning the water, I just created an area of low pressure in the middle and higher pressure on the outside. So what happens is that thing starts spinning and that's what happens in a hurricane and a tornado, higher pressure on the outside, spinning massive air, lower pressure on the inside. So it, it's, it's not really manipulating air, just creating area of lower air pressure, areas of lower air pressure. Great. Do we know why air works like this? Uh, well, it's any part of matter will work like that. Okay, air and water behave a lot alike, um, but you know, as, if it's a solid, you know, a solid form of matter, you're not going to be able to create a vortex with it. But air is it has it has mass. Okay, it's a form of matter, and you can do things to it. Okay, you can see how much it weighs, and you can manipulate it in certain ways. Certain matter has different properties, though. It won't be able to go, it won't be able, you won't be able, be able to manipulate it in those ways. Great. Um, why didn't the smoke from the fire replace the oxygen that it used? Well, smoke, uh, when we light the paper on fire, we're creating a chemical reaction, okay? And so we're changing the paper. And part of that chemical reaction is creating the smoke, okay, and creating the ash, okay? So the smoke doesn't replace the uh, air uh, it's basically just a little byproduct of that paper that's burning, but we're using the oxygen in that air, and so we're reducing the amount of air. So the smoke doesn't really replace it. It's just a little byproduct of that chemical reaction. Great. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you do the Bernoulli effect with a heavier ball? Yes. What we do in our shows is we kick it up a notch. So instead of using this, what we use is a leaf blower. And instead of using this, we use a big giant beach ball, okay? And so we do the same thing with it, but at a way bigger, uh, in a, on a stage, okay? It's a lot of fun. So we manipulate the beach ball and have a lot of fun with it. We can throw it up and down. We can move it around the side. Good question. 
Awesome, great. So that is all the time that we have for questions today. If your question was not answered, don't worry. Uh, we are going to try to track down the answers for you. We will also post the video for this wonderful mad science presentation tomorrow on the St. Pete Science Festival's website. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for such an exciting and hilarious presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined us from their classrooms. We hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.